Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. UFOs, Unidentified Flying Objects, or UAPs, Unidentified Anomalous Phenomenon. That name has changed. Either way, this stuff has gone from sci-fi and conspiracy theory to mainstream serious government inquiry. Never before has the U.S. government so publicly talked about and tackled this subject. It was kind of the third rail for many years. One of the most startling admissions by the U.S. government is that the craft encountered by the military, objects that showed unusual flight capabilities, were not created by classified programs run by the U.S. government or the Pentagon. There is something else going on, and we don't know what it is. My first guest tonight is a big reason this subject has picked up serious traction in the last few years. Jeremy Corbell is a UFO expert, UAP expert, documentary filmmaker. Great to see you again. You know, the first time we spoke, it was about 15 years ago, um, people were looking at me askance in the newsroom when we had you on, like, are you really going to go there? This is now mainstream. Yeah, it is, John, and I was actually skeptical of you, of, of how you were going to treat this subject. Were you going to treat it, you know, fairly like any news report, or were you going to bring your own bias into it? But yeah, we're, we're living in a different world now, and a lot of that is because of some of the content that has been released since, uh, you know, the 2017, a lot of that through George Knapp and myself. It's just astounding where we are today. Yeah, and why is it that you and George Knapp have become the clearinghouse for all these military guys who want to get this stuff out in the public domain. Right. It sounds very mysterious and, and weird, you know, when, when you're not in my shoes. But really, it's because part of telling secrets is keeping them. And I've kept people's trust within the military starting way before, but even with Commander David Fravor, who is one of the top pilots on planet Earth for the United States of America, who actually chased a UFO off the coast of California for the Department of Defense. So we've just become, and George Knapp has been doing this for over 35 years. So when sources know that they can trust you and they're not being heard by their own government, they, they tend to seek you out. Yeah, and 60 Minutes did a big piece on this a while ago. And I think the reporter in that case came away like, what is going on in the skies? Bottom line right now, we don't really know, and, and, the, and the problem is either it is extraterrestrial, which, you know, you get a lot of crazy looks about that one, but the other possibility is that it's China or Russia. It's adversarial of this Earth, and we don't know what it is, and that's really frightening. Well, look, I, I don't rule any of it out. It, it could be stranger than extraterrestrial. Some of these objects are certainly foreign adversarial nations. Uh, some of them might be our black projects, but for sure, with 100% certainty, some of these objects, which have been in our skies since the moment humanity has taken flight, some of those objects, which, by the way, are more technologically advanced than anything that we know of, of other adversarial or technologically advanced nations, some of those objects are obviously being piloted by somebody that we don't know. We don't know where they make them. We don't know uh, how they operate. So that's the rub. Now, you say the word extraterrestrial, and look, that's one of the hypotheses for sure that is. But the thing is, we, we don't know. So the, the, the small amount, which are verified, not ours, not theirs kind of thing, we just don't know. But what's weirder than extraterrestrial? I've heard people say, interdimensional i've heard people say tempera terrestrial which means like time traveling i've heard people say because i've said it techno terrestrials so you know the whole idea here is it's a big question mark but it is a matter of safety yeah and it is also a matter of national security and the government is taking it seriously for those reasons let me let me uh posit this guy kirkpatrick i think it's uh sean kirkpatrick dr sean kirkpatrick in april pushing back on the ET stuff. Take a listen from his congressional testimony. Rowe has found no credible evidence thus far of extraterrestrial activity, off-world technology, or objects that defy the known laws of physics. Now, you've got a PhD guy, a physics guy from Stanford saying baloney. 
uh, and I'm trying to remember his name, it escapes me right now. He says, this stuff is not explained. Which yeah, is it? so that would be Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. He's head of Arrow, which is the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which is interesting because that's why UAP, Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, why that name is changed and why it's called the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. It's the currently, uh, it is the acknowledged, the only acknowledged government agency for the scientific study of the UFO phenomenon by the Department of Defense. But that's out of context right there. Dr. Kirkpatrick is a scientist. They have now, we learned today, over 800 unidentified cases. It's really hard to determine what a UFO is if you're not talking with the pilots of them or seeing where they're from. So I don't take what he said in any way where he's being dismissive. I think he's just being informative to yeah. the public that this is an open and active investigation. What we heard today was a public conference on UFOs by NASA. And there were, I mean, look, NASA has 60 years of experience about. Uh, this is a seventh month old group, and all they study is unclassified data. Uh, they're trying to build a roadmap to study UFOs. That's the messaging that they put out today. They'll put out a report this summer. But it was really cool to see NASA itself coming forward and saying, let's talk about this. Because everybody on that panel, all the scientists, astrobiologists, the FAA, everybody that came to be part of that, unanimously said, we're trying to destigmatize UAP reporting. It was actually Dr. Nikki Fox, I believe was her name. She opened the whole thing by saying, we've received a lot of online abuse and harassment just simply for saying we're gonna be here talking about this. But we learned some really interesting things. Like just in February alone, the FAA has had a huge increase in citing reports, 68 UAP reports, which means people are now feeling more comfortable yeah. reducing and there's the stigma whistle, and, and there's whistleblower protection now. Say it one more time. There's whistleblower protection. They're really trying to protect the whistleblowers on this stuff. So that's a whole nother thing. There's actually le legislation in place. It was signed in the 2023 National Defense Authorization Act, and it was set up to protect people who've worked on very specifically non-terrestrial exploitation programs, people that have direct access and knowledge to illegal black budget programs that have been dealing with the UFO issue for a long time. And there's more than two dozen witnesses that have come forward to give testimony, and some of those witnesses have given testimony to where the hardware is. We're talking about craft. So if they make that public, that's gonna be amazing. Okay, tell, tell me about this triangle, the Mojave Triangle UAP investigation. This is 29 Palms at the military base. These were a bunch of Marines who saw this. And boy, when I saw it, this was actually from two years ago. When I saw it, what I saw was repeat of Phoenix Lights. That's, that's right, that's what I thought too when I saw it. You know, initially I thought these were flares and then during my investigation where I'm trying to get as much footage and as much images, like the world would never see this, all this footage and, the, and these images if I didn't work hard for a couple of years to obtain it all and, and earn the trust of the Marines and, and let them say they, they would go on record with me. Now it is an open investigation. People got so mad because I put it out not knowing yet what it was. We still don't have definitive answers. You know, this was not a flare. Look. This was not a flare drop, Jeremy. So what you're seeing on the screen right now are called illumination flares, and those were shot up over the object you're seeing on the screen now. Okay. Or which is which is a triangle formation. Now the internet, number of people on the internet have have a really solid case that they believe that these are flares. Where I'm stuck is we have all the eyewitness testimony where the Marines feel that they saw a craft. So we have to really get direct and conclusive answers. This may end up being flares like the internet thinks, but we have to find yeah. hardcore evidence exactly when those were shot up, if those were. Right, so I want to show, let me show quickly the Phoenix Lights video so people can compare and contrast. Uh, our governor at the time, Five Symington, he saw the object, there it is. And he said, and he was a Navy pilot, okay? He said, this is otherworldly. I've never seen anything like it. It was a craft, end of story. He absolutely, 
he, to this day, he says, it was a craft. This was not a flare drop. And then we come to find out there were probably two separate events on that night. There was a flare drop and a sighting of what some described as a craft. You got it, so check it out. Some of what you showed there, it's haunting me. I'm getting goosebumps because you've got the same situation where you have these, these you know, trained observers saying, we saw a craft, and then you have those kind of lights that are a little bit out of the, the orientation you'd expect yes. to be on a solid craft. And, and you see that too with their footage. So it makes you wonder, it's like, what was going on? Can we prove this either way? And the Marines just want answers. Jeremy, is the, is the military right now interested because they're worried that China is several steps ahead of us? Is that why they're taking such a keen interest? Our military is taking such a keen interest in this because anything that we don't understand and don't have a 360 degree global view on what's flying in our restricted airspace, right? With that is a concern. Of course, some technologies we're worried about other countries, even like battery life for drones, we're worried about. However, John, some of this stuff has been ruled out. It's been ruled out that the 2019 events were our technologies, were China's or were Russia's. People that don't understand that, they got it wrong. Those are true UAP, unidentified, that huge swarm we had over 10 Navy warships. So yes, yes. And they're worried it's other countries, before. but then yep. when it's not other countries, it's also very bothersome. Yeah, no doubt. Um, it's great to have you on the program again. We're gonna do it again, deal? Anytime, John. Thank you so much for covering this from the very beginning with integrity and without stigma. Thank you. I appreciate that. Jeremy Corbell, great stuff. When we come back, and I, and I hope you stick around, the deadly shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. It's been a year. We take a look back at the lessons learned a year later. Charlie Min has a new documentary out, 77 Minutes, Surviving the Uvalde Mass Shooting. Charlie Min joins me when we return on Newsmaker Saturday. Welcome back. It has been a year since the horrific mass shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, that killed 19 children, mostly 9 and 10 year olds, and two teachers who died trying to protect those kids. Before we speak to documentary filmmaker Charlie Men, I want to play a clip from his film. This is how the documentary begins. I'm in classroom, boys, classroom number 112. 112. 112. 112. 112. Yes, ma'am. What's your name, ma'am? Chloe Torres, 1030. There's a lot of dead bodies. Hold on, please. Is this your classroom 112? Yes, ma'am. Documentary filmmaker Charlie Men joins me now. That is really hard to hear. Thank you for being here. Chloe Torres survived. And you spoke with her and five other kids who survived this for the film. Charlie, what was that like? Gut wrenching, absolutely gut wrenching, beyond emotional. I, I don't, I don't even know what to say. Um, just so proud of those kids. They showed more guts than the police. And uh, Chloe Torres, how she survived that, um, unbelievable. She suggested to one of her friends to put blood on herself so that the killer would think that she was dead. That's one of many heroic stories um, in the documentary, which is on Amazon Prime called 77 Minutes Surviving the Uvalde Mass Shooting. Charlie, um, the failures are widespread in this film. Obviously, the police, 77 Minutes, and, and there is a lot of video of the police standing around once they got there, which took seven minutes, by the way, and the police department, to my knowledge, is only about a mile and a quarter from that school. I don't know what the delay was, but beyond that, there was a lot of standing around in the hallways while gunfire's going off. The video is crystal clear. Uh, the, the video is damning. And um, I've always said this, John, the most beautiful part of a human being is guts. If you have guts, people will respect you. And the police that particular day was gutless. 
you can't teach guts. Either you have it or you don't. And my biggest beef with the police is you guys signed up for this. If you sign up for it, then act appropriately. Don't cower away. And that's exactly what they did. And I have nothing against the police. People think I'm anti-police. One of my proudest films is called Mexico's Bravest Man, which is about a policeman. The man who lowered the murder rate in Juarez and Tijuana and survived eight assassination attempts, Julian Leziola Perez, uh, out of Mexico. Yeah. So I have no problem with the police. I have a problem with cowardice and also anti, uh, excuse me, and injustice. And we have just an unbelievable example here of coward cops who, and again, the video is clear. I don't need to tell the people this. A lot of people have seen the video. It's all in the documentary. And uh, the cops got there uh, in decent shape within a few minutes. But then uh, there's this one shot in the movie where you literally see a cop running away running away from the bullets yeah. from the gunfire charlie the I, was, I was taken i was also taken by some of this footage which, which i had not seen before the cops looked wholly unprepared for what they were encountering a lot of them didn't have shields they didn't have helmets and face masks uh they didn't seem to be geared up for this kind of encounter so the guys who were there, there were a lot of pistols drawn early on. They were no match for a guy with an AR-15, and they could hear the gunfire going off. But as you say, did we not learn anything from Columbine? We haven't learned a darn thing. In 1999, police hesitated there as well. And supposedly, again, supposedly, a new policy was brought in for law enforcement, and that was you have to address the target. In the Uvalde case, we had 400 law enforcement officials, officers, police, you name it, 400 of them basically losing to one criminal. Yeah. I mean, what is, the, what is the point of one of the 400 or many of the 400 standing outside doing jumping jacks, kneeling by their car, when you have a killer inside rooms 111 and 112 just firing away indiscriminately? This, what is the point of being by your car outside. Yeah, there's a clip here that was just mesmerizing. Um, one of the kids had just come out of the bathroom. We're gonna show this clip. He comes out of the bathroom and he had apparently been told before, if there's ever a shooter and you're in the bathroom, get up on the toilet, no feet on the ground and hide in the stall and lock the door so that a shooter would walk by and not see feet. Take a look at this. That kid ran back into the bathroom and did exactly what he was told. He survived. Yeah, and had that kid come out maybe 20 seconds earlier, he would have met the killer face to face because the killer walked in through an unlocked door, which is another problem because all the doors should be locked. Uh, he walked in like it was his own home, made him, uh, just walked in and started shooting everybody. And thank God that kid uh, came out 30 seconds, 20 to 30 seconds after that and everyone just saw it. He saw the shooter and he did the right thing. He ran back, um, he ran away. Uh, I probably would have ran outside, but he ran back into the bathroom. But by then, um, the killer already had his mind made up that he was gonna attack uh, 111 and 112. One of the things in the film that you didn't tackle very much was the shooter. I, I take it that was by design. You don't wanna glorify him because he obviously um, made comments on social media that he wanted to go out and make a mark and be on the news. He was unstable, unhappy, uh, difficult family life, um, had been bullied, had gone to that school and actually gone to the fourth grade in that room, one of the two rooms where the primary uh, killing happened. Do we need to pay, you know, we, we can look at all kinds of things about the response, but do we not have to lay the preponderance of the blame on the shooter? Well, I do that purposely, John. I don't mention the killer's name in my films because I think that creates copycats. As you mentioned, this killer wanted attention, just like the Parkland shooter, just like a lot of these mass shooters. Uh, they want that notoriety. So as long as I'm controlling it, as long as I'm directing these documentaries, I'm not about to give these killers what they want. And I've blamed the media before for um, 
mentioning the killer's name at all costs. I think what that creates is some lunatic is going to be watching all these news reports laying in their bed saying, oh, I want to beat that famous. Well, let yeah. me do what that killer did so I can get all that attention. And particularly and, people uh, who are in mental crisis. It used to be people in mental crisis might take their own life. Now it seems that everybody wants to go out in a quote unquote blaze of glory. It's not enough to kill themselves. They want to make a big splash at the end of their life. I don't get it, but it's happening. There's no doubt. I, I agree with you. Uh, a lot of these criminals are isolated. Uh, they're just uh, extremely unhappy, mentally unstable, and um, they have no hope. They, they're just that desperate. They tend to be loners. It tends to be white males in their early 20s. And um, a lot of them want to go out uh, in a very famous way. The, the, so, you know, the, well. I, th I think the, the central part of your film is actually these kids. They are remarkable. They've been damaged. I want to play a clip. I saw um, my classmates um, dead and my friend dead and my teacher dead. I saw all my friends dead and my teacher dead with all my friends pretending to be dead. I saw things I shouldn't have and I saw 10 people die in front of my face. That's Chloe who made the call to 911. Um, they survived, but they are irreparably changed. 100%. Um, again, we're dealing with kids. We're dealing with 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds who are just starting their life. Some of that age should be, um, they should be, they shouldn't be seeing what they're seeing at that. At, no one should be seeing that, but let alone a child. So you could just imagine the trauma, uh, the PTSD. So their parents, their family is going to have to really watch them closely as they navigate through life. We're having a debate in this town right now, Phoenix Unified High School District, about putting whether to have armed officers on campus. They don't, there's folks on the school board who don't want these people there. They think they're oppressors and create a bad environment. But they may rue the day if somebody comes on a campus with a weapon and there's nobody there to stop them. Uh, I think that's preposterous that, that these people think that they should not be around. Um, I mean, not all cops are bad. We, we have good cops. Yes, we have bad cops. We have average cops. We have gutsy cops. And we have gutless cops. But the bottom line is we do need them. Their presence alone um, could deter a criminal from doing something really, really bad. So I'm not quite sure about the mindset and the thinking on why someone would think that they don't need the police presence. Yeah, they think they're oppressors to the minority community. So they think they create a bad vibe on campus being around with a weapon. Uh, I don't uh, totally, know. Dis totally disagree with that one, John. Yeah. Um, Charlie, where can people see the film? It's on streaming, like, and like everything, uh, like our Robert Fisher movie. Um, I've, I've been able to put 30 movies on streaming. Uh, this one is on Amazon Prime, along with a lot of other major streaming platforms. That's what the independent filmmaking business has shifted to is uh, streaming. Uh, I'm very, very lucky that streaming has exploded and I'm able to use platforms such as Amazon Prime to get my work out there. Uh, bottom line, um, just in a few words, what did you learn? That we are in big trouble in our society. Uh, in America, we kill everybody. We kill children, we kill babies, handicapped people, uh, students, concert goers, people going to the movies. John, there has never been a greater probability, as you and I are talking right now, of an innocent person being shot in America. It's that bad. Charlie Men, filmmaker. Good to see you, Charlie. Thank you for your work. Appreciate it. We'll be back in a moment on Newsmaker Saturday.